Hello and welcome to GameSec. This time we're looking at overlooked games. Now we've done underrated games in the past, but overlooked is kind of different, you know? Underrated are games that may not have been overlooked, they were just yeah. underrated. It's different, but the same theme. Yeah, so. More or less. I mean, overlooked means it just didn't get enough attention. Yeah, we've got a really good set of games, I think, anyways. Yeah, I think too. So. Yeah, let's take a look. I think you got the first one. So. I always have the first one. <laughs> no, you don't. I'm always first. Okay, anyway, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Skull Monkeys on the PlayStation is a really unique game that was overlooked. It's made by Doug Tenapel who created and animated Earthworm Jim. This is the sequel to a PC game called The Neverhood, which was a point and click adventure. This game is an action platformer and is made completely out of clay. Everything is clay from the character and enemy sprites to the backgrounds. What a refreshing game this is. You just don't often see anything like this on home consoles. You're off on a mission to save your homeworld from Clog. Control-wise, your character performs very well. Every now and again, I did have problems landing on platforms, but I eventually got the hang of it. The music is outstanding. Once you start a world, you have a basic music track, and as you progress through the stages, the music adds more layers, making the music full and rich sounding by the last stage. Terry Taylor did a great job with the music, as it has a jazzy, folksy, and maybe even a Dixieland feel to it. This game probably has some of the best bonus room music I've ever heard, too. Yes, here's a little bonus room where you can play. The cutscenes between levels are all done with claymation and are great fun to watch. There are a lot of situations that are just wacky and hilarious. The only bad thing about this game is the difficulty is kind of high with some really, really tough platforming segments. But it's not impossible or anything, so just keep trying. This game is really enjoyable, and you should definitely make an effort to try it out. I want to take a look at Mystic Defender. It's an early game for the Genesis that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. I've always found it pretty enjoyable. It's an action platformer where you control a dude with, yes, mystical abilities. You start out in a forest shooting down otherworldly type enemies and you can even charge up your shot. You'll soon gain other weapons and they'll all need to be charged to work. The fire weapon is very handy for stage 2 and it's really the only way to clear the stairs for example. And the scatter shot can be useful for other situations. You can even collect a few mega bombs during the game which affect everything on screen. In total, there's eight very bizarre rounds to get through with some tricky platforming here and there. Now what a lot of people probably don't know is that this is the sequel to a game called Spellcaster on the Sega Master System. Now that game had some digital comic-like elements to it as well as cool action stages. See the similarities? But Mystic Defender is straight up action and I'm not really sure why they changed the name from Spellcaster. But I am glad that they changed the character from the Japanese version which is based on an anime called Peacock King. Plug the same cartridge into a Mega Drive and the game becomes Peacock King 2 and your cool looking dude now wears a girly dress just like the Japanese version of Spellcaster. Anyway, the game's really fun and it has kind of an addicting quality to it. Everything moves really fast so you've got to be really quick on the controls. The graphics are fairly average for an early Genesis release, but the music is really enjoyable, even if it sounds pretty thin. But the sound effect of the fire, it makes me want to rip my ears off. Now I've seen plenty of people on fire in my time and it sounds totally different. I don't know what they were thinking here. Also, if you have the first revision of this game, the final boss is protecting a nude chick. But in later revisions, they covered up that naughtiness, thank goodness. Anyway, check out Mystic Defender. Nobody else did. Drill Dozer for the Game Boy Advance is another great game by Game Freaks that got overlooked. I feel that this game was overlooked because it came out two years after the DS was released. So while most people have moved on to the new hardware, this little gem was left to fend for the scraps. 
All right, enough about that. Let's get into the actual game. You play the part of Jill who belongs to the Red Dozer Gang. You're trying to get back a diamond stolen from your father by a rival gang and to avenge the beating he took. Your main tool is a Red Dozer that you use to traverse levels and fight enemies and bosses. At the start of every level, your Dozer only has one gear which isn't very powerful. With just one gear you can only access certain parts of a level. You will eventually pick up two more gears which makes your Dozer super powerful and you can break through tough doors and other obstacles easily. The levels are quite large and very well designed. Not once did I get lost traversing back and forth. Once you collect all the gears and power up your dozer, it's off to fight the boss. These battles are really fun and the designers have some great ideas making use of the drill technique. After you defeat a boss, you go back to your mobile HQ where your dozer breaks down and you're back to only one gear. So every level you have the same objectives, collect gears and defeat the boss. Very simple and very entertaining. The control is great. The shoulder buttons control your drill which can be drilled clockwise and counterclockwise. This adds a little bit of depth as certain enemies can only be killed if you drill them in the correct direction. The A button jumps, and that's it, it's nice and easy. The music in this game is awesome. Very high tempo with lots of energy and some very enjoyable melodies. The graphics are very well drawn with great use of colors and detail. The only thing that's quite annoying is the size of your drill gauge. As you can see, it fills the whole screen with a transparent gear and a number to let you know what gear you're in. I don't know why they made this graphic so large, but there it is and you can't miss it. Other than that, this is a super fun game that you should check out. It also has a rumble pack built into the cart for that extra enjoyment factor. Predator 2 on the Genesis is based on the smash hit movie starring Danny Glover. The game's an isometric run and gun. Your main goal is to rescue a whole bunch of hostages and then make it to the exit. And just like in the movie, all you have to do to rescue them is touch them. But there's a whole bunch of baddies popping out of everywhere that really want you dead. So what are you going to do? Shoot back, of course. When the bad guys die, they turn into drugs which you can collect for points. In fact, if you're into collecting every last thing, you're not going to get very far in this game. More bad guys will appear by the time you finish collecting the items and killing them causes even more items to appear that you're going to want to collect. It's a never-ending cycle. Sometimes you just got to know when to move on. Holding down the B button lets you strafe with your weapon while holding down A lets you fire in the direction you're running. C switches your weapons if you have any extra. Overall, the game is fast-paced and pretty fun. You really wouldn't expect it to be. Granted, the graphics aren't amazing, and the street level makes three appearances in the game, which is kind of lame. The music's okay, nothing great, but really nothing to complain about either. The game can get pretty tough, and that's why there's a password here. You're gonna need it. Still, you might want to check this one out if you can find it for cheap. Yeah. Predator 2 also made it to the Master System. It's similar to the Genesis game, but this one has four scrolling levels that only scroll in one direction from what I've seen. It's ridiculously hard, and if you want to kill enemies, it's impossible not to get hit. Now this one's a bit glitchy because it's one of those games that really only works well on European PAL consoles and spazzes out a bit on NTSC consoles. But no matter what region you're playing in, pass this one up and get the Genesis version instead. Super Chase HQ. That stands for high quality, folks. This is a SNES game that was definitely overlooked. If you haven't played a Chase HQ game, then here's how it works. You play as a cop in the Chase Special Investigation Department. Your job is to catch criminals via high-speed pursuits. Once you catch up to a criminal's car, you ram it over and over until it's disabled, then you make the arrest. Maybe it's because Taito made a big change in the way the game is played and people were a bit turned off. You see, previous games in the Chase HQ series are played with a view from behind the car. This is the PC Engine version here. But Super Chase HQ moves the view to the inside of the car. Typically, I myself am not a fan of this, but it's really cool in this game. 
I really like seeing your character's facial expressions change in the rearview mirror. You'd think the limited view of the road would affect the gameplay, but it really doesn't. The game starts off fairly easy as you chase your suspect with little to no obstacles on a wide road. As the game progresses, obviously it's going to get harder. Roads become more curvy and there's lots more traffic to dodge. You'll even have to face oncoming traffic. There's enemies on motorcycles who shoot at you or even throw flaming things. Not only this, but the bosses or criminal cars get tougher. Their life bars become longer, making it harder and harder to disable them before the time runs out. You do get three turbos to use at your discretion. Using a turbo lets you ram the criminal car and catch up to it again much faster. If you don't have any turbos, then each time you ram the criminal's car, you get set back and you have to catch up again. This wastes a lot of time, so save those turbos. Graphically, the game is pretty darn good. The inside of your car looks great, as do the backgrounds. Everything is full of color. Criminal cars and, well, any car on the road just look average and blocky. I mean, there's not much detail in them. The music fits the game great and has quick tempo which is perfect for racing. And finally, the control is really responsive just like you would expect it to be. Try this game if you get the chance, it's great fun. Alright, and this is the part where we segue, we focus back onto ourselves for a sec, and then we go back and talk about other games. It's just the way GameStack works. That is, right. I mean, we're just here talking heads and uh, just to add filler to the video, so I hope you're enjoying this. Yes, I go, am. Yeah, let's go back to more games. The Space Adventure Cobra for the Sega CD by Hudson Soft is a digital comic in the vein of Snatcher or maybe even Rise of the Dragon. Almost everything is done by selecting text in order to figure out what you want to do next. A graphical display, of course, accompanies the text. This is actually the second game in the Cobra series. The first one was on the PC Engine CD-ROM, and as you can see, it's all in Japanese, so I really can't show you very much. But this is the first one released in the US, and as far as I know, it's the only one in English. Anyway, you're Cobra, an intergalactic badass who owns space. Yep, he actually owns space, the game says so. You run into a girl named Jane, and during a standoff with a common foe, it's revealed that she has part of a map tattooed on her back. After you both escape, she reveals that she's one of three triplets that have part of a map tattooed on them. This map supposedly leads to an awesome space treasure. Money and women? How can Cobra say no? So you set off to find the other two triplets and hopefully you can get them before the main assassin Crystal does. So being a digital comic, obviously it progresses at a rather slow pace and you need to really make sure you select everything twice if you want to get all the new options to appear. Now this can be kind of annoying if you're not used to digital comics, but if you are, you'll be right at home here. The game is also fairly linear due to its nature, but I really don't see that as a bad thing. The story's pretty fun, and overall I'd say it's a great game, however I do have a few quibbles. Firstly, it's often difficult to tell who's talking during the text dialogues. Characters interchange sentences and there are no line breaks or anything. Secondly, the spoken dialogue seems to be recorded really low in comparison to the music. You're not. What did you do? Tell me? Anyone who could kill Doc as easily as you did is worth following around. This game barely sold at all when it was released and I got mine brand new for like 10 bucks. The only reason I picked it up was because of the mature rating. I wanted to see some hardcore Sega CD boobage. You'll get a little, but not too much. If you like the digital comic genre, be sure to go back in time and pick this one up when it was cheap. Pocket Fighter on the PlayStation is a great twist on Street Fighter. At first glance, it looks just like a cute version of Street Fighter that uses only four buttons, so naturally it must not have any depth, right? This assumption would be wrong, as there's plenty of depth in this little fighter. The game is really good looking as you can see, and all the characters are super deformed. Even the backgrounds are loaded with awesome animations and are just fun to look at. So the first big difference that you will notice from Street Fighter are the colored gems that fly all over the screen when you hit your opponent or take a hit. At the bottom of the screen are three small gauges that get leveled up by collecting these gems. 
They max out at level 3 and each one will power up a punch, kick and special move that each character has. For example, Morrigan's Soul Fist Fireball thing is hugely powerful at level 3 versus level 1. It's very important to collect these gems if you want a powerful character. Next, there is only one punch, one kick and one special button. There's also a taunt button but that's pretty useless. It's been simplified from Street Fighter and it works really well. Each character can start a small combo with just the punch button. You can build on this combo by pressing either punch, kick or special. These are really fun to watch as your character's outfit changes with each successive button press. The special button can be held in to power up a special attack that will release larger gems from your enemy. My only real complaint about this game is that there are so few playable characters. Capcom should make a sequel with loads of characters, at least 30. That's not asking too much, is it? Nah, I didn't think so. Check this game out as it's not one to be missed. It's also available for the Saturn and makes use of the RAM cart. Air Diver was an early release for the Genesis by Seismic. It was going to be a while before Afterburner came out, so I decided to take a chance on this one, and you know what? I was glad I did. Basically, you fly a super secret fighter on a mission to invade countries all over the world. Well, that's not the real story, but it might as well be. You're stuck in a cockpit view, which offers you a radar to spot enemies as well as fuel and missile information. You start off by picking a country to invade. Once you get there, that country sends its fighters out to stop you and you've got to bring them down and avoid their attacks as well. There are a few ways to do this. You can simply try to move out of their way or maybe even roll to the side. If you've got an enemy approaching behind you or if he locks onto you, you'll want to loop around so that suddenly you're behind him for an easy kill. Once you shoot down enough planes, you'll need to beat the elite badass fighter of the stage. He always takes multiple hits and flies around really fast. He's an ass. After you murder him, you'll be able to take on the Super Carrier. Fighting these is kind of weird. In fact, it reminds me a lot of fighting the Flying Fortresses and Afterburner on the Sega Master System. Anyway, once you defeat this, you go back to your Flying Carrier, get fixed back up, and select a new part of the world to invade. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Now this game's certainly not for everybody, and it takes a bit of time to learn how to best play the game, but once you do, it's actually really fun. The graphics aren't amazing, but they are pretty colorful and the time of day even changes as you play the stage. The music fits the game really well and it definitely isn't bad for an early title. I say take a chance on Air Diver, you might like it. There was also Super Air Diver for the Super Nintendo released in the US as Lock On. This game takes you out of the cockpit and places you over a Mode 7 background. The premise and the controls are pretty much the same, though the game does seem to have a slower pace. It is still a pretty good game though. That was followed up by Super Air Diver 2 only in Japan for the Super Famicom. In my opinion, this one's a lot worse with super slow control and unexciting gameplay. So stick with Air Diver or at least Lock On. Klonoa on the PlayStation was pretty much overlooked at the time of its release. Since then it's gained a cult following, but I still feel it's not as widely known as it should be. It's a great action platformer by Namco that's loads of fun to play with easy controls and very pretty graphics. I don't know, but I think this might be the first game of its kind to have a pseudo 3D playfield. Most people call this 2.5D, but not me. It's a typical platformer, but the playfield will wrap around mountains and curves in a 3D-esque fashion. I was really blown away at the time by this style and I wanted more games like this. Sadly, very few games of this style came out and the games that did get released weren't as good as Klonoa. So you've got to rescue a girl from some evil guy and that's pretty much the basic story here. You have the help of this little thing called Yupo who simultaneously has the cutest and most annoying voice of all time. He lives in your ring, I think, and he helps you dispatch enemies. The enemies are caught with the ring and used to do a double jump type of maneuver and also can be flung into other enemies. It's simple and it works really well. The music is pretty good here and it has some nice melodies which complement the style and look of the game. Graphically the game was really impressive at the time and even today is still fairly lush and has a nice color palette. This is definitely a game to check out if you don't already have it in your PlayStation collection.
Klonoa even got a remake on the Wii, and it looks really nice and controls just as well as the first game using the Wii Remote. To top it off, this version is in 16x9 widescreen. This remake also got overlooked and never gained a huge following either. Here's a quick side-by-side -side comparison. Both games can be easily obtained on eBay, and the Wii version is actually cheaper. This is one game not to miss, so be sure to get whichever version you can. Now let's get a bit more modern. 3D Dot Game Heroes on the PlayStation 3 is a really great action RPG. The name of the game is stupid, but hey, it's a great game. Basically, the game takes place in a 2D world, but the people start up becoming disinterested in 2D, so the king declared that from now on, everything will be 3D. Yeah. As a result, the game has an amazingly unique look that's really cool. Now, you've probably already noticed that the game is a shameless Zelda ripoff. If you've ever wanted to play old school Zelda on a modern console, well, you can't do any better than this. You've got your typical overworld that you'll need to explore to find the temples as well as the temples themselves. Inside the temples, you'll need to collect keys and new items to help you find your way to the boss. After defeating the boss, you get an orb and then it's off to the next temple for you. I love how your sword is simply huge in this game to the point of being ridiculous. Hell, you can even get it improved by the blacksmith if it's not ridiculous enough. However, if you take a hit, your sword's range and power decrease dramatically until you're able to get your life back up to full power again. But when you are powered up, it's very satisfying to be able to take out multiple enemies from a distance. Ah oh, yeah, that's awesome. There's lots of places to travel to and getting to the temples is at least half the fun. You can also partake in mini games in the towns and they're pretty decent diversions. The graphics, like I said, are amazing. There's some really cool low depth of field effects that make everything look like toys. It's really awesome to see distant objects come into focus as you approach. When you kill something, the pixels shatter all over the place. There's a lot of really nice touches and they did a great job here. The game's dialogue is great too. It takes no shame in its love for the 8-bit days and you can tell the developers had fun making this one. The majority of the music is fantastic as well and definitely worth recording onto your iPod or whatever you have. There's even a character editor where you can build your own pixelated characters to use in the game. All in all, this game is great fun to play and quite addicting. Yeah, it's a Zelda clone, but you know what? I personally think it outdoes most Zelda games. Now from what I read, it only sold a bit over 175,000 copies worldwide, but it really should have sold a lot more. If you have a PS3, you really need to have this in your library. It's modern old school at its best. Okay, and those were some cool Overlook games. I thought I liked them all. Yeah, I did too. I really like 3D Dot Game Heroes. Yeah, you know? I mean, any Zelda ripoff that's done right like that is great. Indeed. And you know, what games do you guys think were overlooked that were good? And you know, some yes. games are overlooked for a reason. These yes. games, I feel, weren't. So let us know, and we'll start working on the next episode. We haven't even decided what that's going to be yet. So it's a surprise <laughs> to us too. <laughs> all right, and thanks for watching Game Sack. That 3D Dot Game Hero sure made me in the mood for another Zelda ripoff. Crusader of Senti, where the hell is it? What? <sighs> okay, maybe some Musha. <sighs> Dave, get down here right now! Yeah, Joe, what's up? What the hell is this? It's it's an IOU note. It's it's pretty universal thing. I mean, I figure you know what one is. Yeah. So can I borrow Neo Turf Masters? Okay, thanks. That's awesome. And uh, the funny thing, I don't even have a Neo Geo, so I'm gonna need to borrow yours. <laughs> You're a great friend, Joe. Thanks, man.
Oh, I forgot. Here you go. Here's that. You're gonna need that. Yeah.